Good morning, y'all. Uh, Aaron, will you up? You want to taste the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we're grateful to be here this Sunday morning, Lord, and bless the service today as Brother Bruce and Brother Aaron will teach us in your words, God, and we're so grateful to be here today to serve and worship you, dear Lord. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, we move over to the 21st chapter of Acts today, and this is uh, continuing on with Paul's journey to Rome. Um, last week's you know lesson, we was in uh, 20 chapter, of course, and uh, they just uh, had the uproar in Ephesus in the chapter before that, so he, he was leaving Ephesus, and... Um, he visited around some of the churches that uh, were established there and on his journey back to Rome. Um, and, you know, on his way, it's, it's kind of interesting that he had quite a few friends join in with him. And so Paul, you know, he had some supporters in the ministry, but he also had the opposition from the Jews that he faced all the time. And, and in today's lesson, that kind of comes to a head for him. Um, when he was in Troas, you know, in that, in that 20th chapter, remember, uh, you, you might remember about him preaching late into the night, and the guy fell out of the window. I, I don't know if I can... Eutychus, I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, I listened to the that little uh, CD of that, and I try to remember the pronunciation, but I usually forget... <clears throat> Uh, but he fell from the third loft, it said, and Paul went down and uh, revived the man. He was dead, and uh, the man comes back to life. And, you know, Paul was uh, <clears throat> able to perform some special miracles at, at least part of the time through his ministry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he stops off at, if I pronounce this right, Miltus or something like that, and he calls for the elders at Ephesus. He doesn't actually go physically to Ephesus himself. Uh, he's, he's wanting to get to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he calls for these elders, and he gives them basically a farewell speech. And you know, he tells them that he, he won't be seeing them face-to-face -face anymore, uh, which you know, this makes these, these folks sad. They, you know, they're not, not happy. They have a... Actually, a sad departure from each other right there at that point in time. <clears throat> but he gives them some words of encouragement. He, he lets them know what lies ahead for them, what to watch out for. Uh, kind of gives them a little pep talk to, to send them on their way in, in the ministry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Get my throat clear. Um, he's warned not to go into Jerusalem, um, but you know there, there's debate on that. And as we go through this lesson, I can get your all's opinion on that. See what you think um, about this. But he's he's warned not to go into Jerusalem, and he admits himself that in every town, you know, he's. Warned of the Holy Spirit of what lies ahead. But <clears throat> there's debate over this, and I don't know that anyone uh, really can take the Scripture and say, yes, this states that he shouldn't have went in, or this states that he should have. Uh, people have different opinions on this. And as we go through this, you know, maybe you can express your opinion. Um, Maybe you're undecided, whatever, but uh, you know, feel free to, to give your opinion whether you think that he should have or shouldn't have went to Jerusalem at this time. Um, he runs into, <clears throat> obviously he runs into problems at Jerusalem. So getting into our lesson today, <coughs> excuse me, we'll read verses 1 through 6 in chapter 21. And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them, as leaving Miltus, you know, he just talked with the elders at Ephesus. 
and we got from them. And at last we came with a straight course unto Coos and the day following to Rhodes and from thence to Patera. Now, something that's uh, you know, not really stated in the scriptures, no, no mention of it here that I know of. Uh, Rhodes, there was supposed to have been that huge statue, the Colossus of Rhodes. It was built to um, a false deity. It was uh, in honor, I can't remember. I'm trying to remember what god that was that they were worshiping there at that time. But anyway, it was built in honor because they got a military victory over somebody, and I can't remember who that was either. But they, they had this military victory, and so they built this huge statue in honor of the God that they were worshiping. And it's supposed to be one of the seven wonders of the world, but there's nothing left of it. <laughs> so uh, there's much speculation on this statue that is supposed to be a wonder of the world, but there's nothing left of it. And evidently history records it as being built, but Paul may have or may not have seen some of that at that time. It may have lay in ruins at that time because the thing fell down. Uh, but at one time it, it was speculated that it spanned the harbor there. Then later on, people who had some knowledge of engineering said, well, that wouldn't have worked. It didn't straddle the harbor like they once thought. So what was really there, you know, who knows? Uh, it was, I guess, uh, destroyed, uh, carried off, so it's gone. So all that effort that was put into worshiping that false deity is just by the wayside now. But we still have God's word today, and we still worship the God of the Bible today. And that statue is long since gone. No actual record of what it was, was really like. Uh, you know, we have a lot of speculation about it. So that, that shows you right there that all that effort really didn't mean a whole lot, did it? <clears throat> but, like I say, Paul may have seen that statue. It probably would have been laying there in ruins. If I remember the dates right, at the time he would have went through there, it possibly would have been in ruins at that time, laying there. Um, there's no mention of it. And you can probably understand why, because when Paul talked about meats offered to idols, he said, idol means nothing to me. So he didn't even, uh, Luke was recording this, there's no mention really of what that idol was right then. Of seeing the thing or, you know, how magnificent it might have looked at one time, <clears throat> no mention of that. They didn't even waste paper and ink on that at that time. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went ab abroad and set forth. Now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlade her burden. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave one of another, we took ship, and they returned home again. Back at verse 4, we back up there, we see you know, the warning here, and this is one of the, the verses that the people used to, to um, support the, the thought that Paul should not have went up to Jerusalem because it says, through the Spirit, that he uh, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Um, some feel like this was a warning from the Holy Ghost that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Um, I read uh, J. Vernon McGee's thoughts on this, and he he's in support of the fact that Paul uh, 
he feels it's the fact that Paul should go should have went up to Jerusalem. That this is just saying this is just a warning. This is this is what awaits you. Do you want to undergo this assignment? You know, do you still choose to go to Jerusalem even though as Paul testified earlier, that bonds and afflictions awaits him in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Do you still want to go through with, with what, what you're doing? That's the way J. Vernon McGee takes this, as more of a warning than a command not to go. Uh, I thought it was a nice thing here when we read about how that, uh, as he left Tyre, He's going down, they go down to the seashore, and the, and the people walk out with him, you know, their wives, their children. In other words, the families that's going out with Paul to see him off. And I thought this is something that is really nice to read about because in our day and time, the family is being disassembled in our modern day times. For some reason, we just, the family is very much under attack. It's... <clears throat> Families doing things together is um, almost gets to be a thing of the past. I mean, it's nice to go over to Central Park and see families out doing things together. <clears throat> it's it's nice to see families come to church together, but you see less and less of that, don't you? You see less families come to church. Um, I know we live in a time where people work odd shifts. I know Aaron. You do too work odd shifts. Uh, it's, you know, sometimes you can't help that. Um, and I myself have, have had to do that a lot and probably will continue to, to do some of it. It's just a, a fact of life. But still, when the opportunity's there, we need to seize that opportunity to be here, to, to be as a family in church. And, that, and I thought this was nice that the whole family walked out with Paul to see him off. It just it just didn't say, well, goodbye, you know, and shut the door behind him, and there he goes. They walked out with him and seen him seen him off. So that was a nice nice thing to do, I thought. And I think it showed <clears throat> the effectiveness of his ministry, the fact that he did touch people's hearts, they did appreciate the gospel that he was preaching. This, this was a... A time where there was a lot of pagan worship, but still these folks here, their hearts was set on God. I thought that was a nice thing. <clears throat> Anyone have any, anything to comment so far? Any? No one yet wants to speculate on whether or not Paul should have or should not have went to Jerusalem? No takers on that yet, huh? <clears throat> Well, either way you take it, you're probably not going to be alone because that's been debated for many years, and I doubt that anyone will ever, uh, you know, you can probably take Scripture and and um, prove your point one way or another, or support your point one way or another, I'll put it that way. You may not prove it, but um, you'll find support one way or another of it, so whichever way you want to take it, uh, you know, that's that's entirely up to you, but. <clears throat> I agree with uh, J. Vernon McGee because I, I, uh, I thought Paul should have gone even before because when uh, God called him on the road to Damascus in the ninth chapter, you'll find where God told him uh, or told Ananias mm -hmm. what this man was going to suffer yep. and what he had in store for him. And yep. so as yet, Paul had not appeared before some kings and yep. and all this royalty. Mm -hmm. So uh, he still still had that to do, and that Paul was knew what was ahead of him. Yeah. So that's just my thinking on it. So um, I don't, you know, it don't matter. Don't yeah. Matter anybody agrees, but that's uh, when you read back what. Yeah, totally nice and mm -hmm. Paul knew what was yeah, and and that's a good point. That's that's one of the things that people used to prove that the, the their thoughts that he should have went to Jerusalem is the very thing he's going to appear before kings. And as far as the families, uh, the first thing. 
thing that God created, I mean, as far as humans, was a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And that is the foundation. The home, you, so goes the home, so goes the church, so goes your nation. Yeah. The home is the foundation. Yeah. And it says when the foundation is destroyed, what can you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing tumbles down. And, and you see our nation tumbling right now, I really believe. It's been sliding for a long time, but it's, it's going into a free fall, I believe. Anyone else? Let's look at verses 7 through 9. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to... Potolomus uh, and salute the brethren and abode with them one day. And the next day, <clears throat> we that were of Paul's company departed and came to, to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Here again, he's, he's making his way back to Jerusalem. And as he stops along this way, Philip, the, I, I take this as Philip, one of the people who were supposed to be one of the seven deacons, the way I take it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's who I feel like this guy was. And uh, he had these daughters which prophesied. So at this point in time, you know, the scripture had not been pinned down. We didn't have this, I mean, we had the Old Testament, the, the prophets, the law and the prophets, but we didn't have this New Testament that we have today. So prophecy was still a part of uh, what was going on at that time. Now, be careful. As I, as I go through these things, you, we're reading historical accounts of what happened then, and remember, be careful when some guy stands up and says, hey, you know, I'm prophesying, the Holy Spirit told me, you know, just be careful what's, you know, don't listen to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Compare it against this word before you, someone comes up to you and tells you, hey, I'm a prophet, you know. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, most likely they're probably not going to be. <laughs> um, so just be careful. Don't listen to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Make sure you compare it against Scripture and it's, scripturally accurate and when we as we mentioned many many times always check your interpretation of the scripture what I believe over here does it contradict something over here if it does then your interpretation is wrong the, the scripture is not going to contradict so just be careful about that um, but we, we see here these, these four daughters of Philip, you know, evidently, as Miller was talking about the family, they were raised in a family of, of believers, and that, that is carrying on. They're, they are participating in the, the early church, which is great. <clears throat> Paul gets another warning as we, as we read on here. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Different times here, Paul's getting a warning. You know, back in the 20th chapter, he, he was warned. Um, and now, let's say the interpretation is correct that he needs to go to Jerusalem. 
he's getting insight from his friends, oh, don't go. And you got to remember, different times in your life, you know, well-meaning people who are, you know, are thinking out, are really thinking in your best interest may not want you to go a certain direction, but the Holy Spirit is leading you in that direction. And sometimes the way God leads you don't always make sense to um, to the world. It doesn't really make sense to what you think you should do. It um, To the natural mind, to the, the person that's thinking only of worldly things. But whenever God's Spirit leads you to go do something, like, I mean, there's been people who's been led to go to Africa and be a missionary, and they may have left a, uh, a really good job, uh, a comfortable lifestyle, and go to something that's very, very difficult. Uh, things like that happen in life. And to people whose only thoughts is, you know, uh, I need to work this job, make money, retire, um, kick my feet up. Going to Africa as a missionary may not make any sense to that person. And so be careful when you, you listen to, um, to the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're listening to the Holy Spirit. And when you know for certain that it's the Holy Spirit, you don't let the outside influences influence you. And I say that, you know, that's I, like, oh, this is just an easy thing. But, yeah, I, I, it's not. I mean, I know in my own life uh, you have to sort things out. And it's not always easy. And I've not always went the right way. looking for a little something here I wanted to refer back to. Just give me just a second. Okay, back in the 24th verse of the 20th chapter, where Paul testifies that he knows that, that the Holy Ghost is witnessing to him in every city, you know, that problems are awaiting him in Jerusalem. It says in the 23rd verse, we'll read through the 24th, it says, Save, um, okay, wait a minute here, uh, verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. He doesn't know exactly, but the Holy Ghost tells him a little bit about what's going to go on. He says, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, his, what's important to him is finishing out his work that God is giving to do. He says, I want to finish my course with joy. Well, bonds and afflictions waiting him, but he's saying, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I want to finish with joy, but he's got that laying ahead of him. But he knows that... <clears throat> In going through the bonds and afflictions, he's going to fulfill the will of God for the ministry. So that's going to be the joy that he's looking for. And I think 
you know, when he's influenced by his friends here not to go up to Jerusalem, you know, he's, he's just bound and determined from what we read back and I just read to you from the 20th chapter that he's not going to listen to them. He's going to listen to the Spirit of God leading him. That's what he wants to do. He wants to finish whatever work God has got for him. That's what he's bound and determined to go do. But on the other hand, God is warning him what lies ahead. He's got a tough road to hoe ahead of him, and it's not like God is not warning him and giving him a chance here. I guess he could have bowed out of this if he wanted. But if he did, he wouldn't have fulfilled God's God's work in the ministry. Uh, Let's look at verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So as we, we read what we did back in the 20th, we refer back to that and what we read here. Paul's aim is to finish out the ministry that God has for him to do. I think that is what's on his mind first and foremost here. I think this man had a a great burden for the fact that he was way off course early on in his life, how he persecuted the church, he wasted the church. He testified to the fact that he wasted the church. And now I think he's uh, not not trying to work for his salvation. Don't give me, don't interpret that in this. What I'm saying, but I think now I think he's trying to make up for what he wasted in, in a way. Not that not that he can reverse that or what he did. None of us can, but I think he's trying to make the most of what he's got left. You know, I messed up here, but. You know, there's no use to mope around and beat myself up for it. I might as well make the most of what I got left here. So the rest of his life, he's got left to fulfill the will of God. And I think he's fighting hard to do that. You know, we all fight temptation. We all fight to try to to do the right thing. And maybe we don't always succeed. But I think this man in his heart, he's wanting to fulfill the will of God with what time he has left to live on this earth. Let's look at verses 14 through 17. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. So they figured they they were going to change his mind, uh, but we want God's will to be done. And I think that's what Paul wanted also. But after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. And there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Nansen uh, of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So far, so good, but that, this changes quickly here in the story. Let's look at 18 and 19. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So he gives a report. But then we, we still have a problem here between the Jews that convert to Christianity. There's still a little still a little friction here, you know, like we said different times, this is a transitional point, and they still struggle with this. And so they, they're trying to, to get over this hump. So you have Gentiles that believe in Christ who weren't in the Jewish religion. And the disciples, if you remember they wrote to them, and and we'll read about that a little bit here. It goes over it, but they wrote to them and gave them certain commands to do, but they didn't have to keep the law. They didn't have to become a Jew to be a Christian. You know, they, they um, did away with that confusion when they give them 
the mandate that uh, you don't have to keep the Jewish law and traditions. You're a Gentile. You know, you do these certain things, and that's that's okay. You know, keep down friction, but you don't have to convert to the Jewish religion and then to Christianity. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Christian. But there's still confusion amongst the people who are Jews that have converted over to Christianity. These people have had it drilled in their mind, probably from when they was born till they're an adult, that keeping the law is the thing to do. They, the Jewish people had all these customs and traditions and uh, ceremonies that they went through, and it's hard for these people to give these up. And so... The disciples at Jerusalem, they come up with a plan to try to appease these people just because there's a, they're thinking that Paul is against the law. And that just, you know, these Jews just can't hardly handle that. So they come up with this plan. Well, the plan, you know, might have appeased some people, but it kind of backfired on Paul as far as his freedom was concerned. We'll see how that goes here. Look at verses uh, 20 through 25. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. These guys, they, yeah, we accept Christ, but we, you know, we want to still keep the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now, that verse there, I don't know how true that report was about Paul. I don't know that he was exactly teaching that. Um, I really can't say on that. Maybe someone has read enough, maybe you've read somewhere else that clarifies this, but I, I can't recall of anything that he exactly said that. But it, certainly Paul does not believe that you are saved by keeping the law. He's plain on that when you read Romans and Galatians. That clarifies that right there exactly. There's no doubt. He does not believe in keeping the law in order to be saved. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come, to, come together, for they, will hear thee, or for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say unto thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Now, if you want to read about this vow, you can go to, um, I think it's the ninth chapter of Numbers. If I remember, sixth or ninth chapter. Anyway, it's in Numbers. You'll find it. <laughs> uh, gosh, I should have written that down. I can't remember, sixth or ninth. Anyway, somewhere right in there, you'll find it. Uh, it talks about the Nazarite vow. And you can read about that custom, how they, you know, they stayed away from wine. They, uh, they didn't drink anything from the vine. Uh, they uh, didn't cut their hair. And then at the end of this vow, they cut their hair and it was burned as part of the sacrifice. Uh, so when you go back in there, you read that, you see what, what these men were about to do. Uh, well, there was a sacrifice here and... Paul was going to pay for that sacrifice, if you'll read on here. He agrees to pay for this. Then take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Okay, they're wanting him to pay for their vow, to be part of this ceremony. They're wanting Paul to come in and be part of this Jewish ceremony to show people that he is not against the Jewish law, that he's not against Moses, that, you know, like when Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians that to the Jews he became a Jew, that he might, you know, he might get some of these people to accept Christ their Savior. And that's what he's going to do here. Now, here's, here's the thing. When you look at this, some might say, well, Paul's compromising on grace. 
Salvation is dependent upon what you are trusting in, not your little ceremonies you keep. You know, we have a service here. We, we have a general routine, and sometimes we don't follow it exactly, but other churches might do things a little different. They have a little different ceremonies. Some churches take communion more often. Um, different ways different ways they handle their services different little rituals they have things they do all those little things really are not what pleases god christ told some people one time he said you know you worship me with your lips but your heart is far from me god told the israelites that at one time he said your burnt offerings, they're, they're nothing. I'm not really interested in those burnt offerings. They, they're no benefit to me. That's just paraphrasing. And why weren't they? Because their heart was not right with God. They were just going through a ceremony. They, they went through the motions. They, they did the ceremony. Well, if, if you're a Jew and you want to keep these ceremonies, why are you keeping these ceremonies? Are you saved because you believe in Christ and you're trusting in him for your salvation and then you keep these ceremonies as just part of your your worship or are you depending on your ceremonies plus the blood of Christ to be saved what are you really trusting in do we trust in our songs we sing here uh, do we trust in our our ability to walk a Christian life, to be saved. What do we really trust in? Do we trust fully in the blood of Christ and that only? And then the rest of these things we do out of worship, out of service to God, out of respect to God. Or are we trusting in the things we do plus the blood of Jesus Christ? You, know, you can't have both of them. Uh, and one of the things that I remembered so much from Brother Mickey's preaching here over the years, you cannot mix law and grace. Works and grace do not mix. Um, if they are keeping these ceremonies just out of a routine of worshiping God uh, as honoring God through through these this Nazarite vow that they're going through, if that's just an, an honoring of God, it's part of their worship routine, I mean, that's one thing. But if they're trusting in that plus the blood of Christ, that's wrong. And I'm certain from reading Paul's writings that he would not have been trying to mix the grace of God with this Nazarite vow and combine those two and come up with salvation. I full, fully believe he was trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ and that only. That is the important thing here. These Jews had a hard time letting go of their ceremonies, the, their rituals that they had. And Paul was showing that, hey, you know, if you want to keep your ceremonies, that, that's fine. Trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you want to do this ceremony, that's okay. Just trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 25, it goes on ahead to mention about what they said about the Gentiles keeping the law. As touching the Gentiles, which believe we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from the things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. <clears throat> so they were trying to make, bring some harmony between these Jews who wanted to keep their rituals and Paul who was preaching grace. Uh, you, know, you had... The, and like we said here, what verse 25 said about the Gentiles, that they, you know, um, you know keep the things from, keep what meats offered to idols, from things strangled, from uh, blood, um, from fornication. They wrote them commandments to them. So they should be able to get along with their Jewish counterparts real good who were Christians by by doing those things there. They shouldn't, should, they really could could do those things and not really have any uh, either one of them be offended. That's what they're saying. So let's see what Paul does here. Verses 26 through 29. Then Paul took 
the men the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the day's purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So he's entering into this ritual with these men. He's going to, he's going to pay for their, um, their whatever they owed at the temple for the sacrifice, I guess. And when seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, and doesn't say what town in Asia, um, some may speculate around Ephesus, I don't know, um, hard tell. He had a lot of trouble there at Ephesus, but who knows. Anyway, they were of Asia, might have been several cities. When they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place and further brought Greeks also into the temple and had polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Now, they just supposed that. They didn't know. But now there's these people from Asia, which would be modern-day Turkey, have come down here. They're stirring up the Jews in Jerusalem. They see Paul there, and they see a chance to get him. So they just think, well, he might have took Trophimus into the, the temple and polluted you know, Gentile into the Jewish temple and polluted the place. So, you know, they just... They just threw that in there for extra measure, it seems like. They, they knew that would add a little fuel to the fire, you know. They could, they could fan the fire with that. So this stirs up a huge ruckus here. <coughs> Verses 30 through 32. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came, unto the chief captain of the band, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions, ran down unto them, and when they, had, they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating, the, left beating of Paul. So Paul had been beaten up many times in his lifetime by now. Uh, and, I, you know, I don't know, he might have, realized that from the Holy Spirit leading him that he wasn't going to die there, that this just going to be another beating. I don't really know what you know, what went through his mind. You kind of wonder. But nevertheless, the, the Jews here, their aim is to kill him. So the, the Romans, they run down there. They're trying to keep peace here. So they, they rescue Paul. The, uh, let's read 33 through 36. And, and remember, these Romans, they just see a big ruckus going. They don't know what's going on. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing and some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the, the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. So here you got a, a band of soldiers, and these people are still acting up. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But you'd think they would have done something to them. But they, they get this one guy, Paul, you know, the guy that they're beating up on. They figure, well, if all these people beating up on this one guy, he must be guilty, you know. For the multitude of the people followed after crying away with him. Now, our lesson ends kind of abruptly. This just chapter ends kind of, uh, kind of funny. They, they broke off right in the middle of, of the thought. You know, it's almost like um, one of these movies you've got to wait for the next time for it to come on to, to see what the end is, you know. You've got to go to the next chapter to see what's going on. But we'll, we'll finish up here reading the rest of this chapter um, Paul is wanting to, to talk to the Jewish people and explain his position with them. 
Uh, it's amazing here that through all what he's been through here, he still wants to witness to these people. Now, he beat him up, you know, it'd be kind of, I'm kind of thinking in my mind, you know, it'd be kind of hard for me to think about witnessing to him right now. They just beat me up. So, uh, you know, I'd be probably thinking some mean thoughts. But he is still wanting to witness to these people and explain the story of Jesus Christ, the gospel. And as Paul was led to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made an uproar and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? Now, you know, think about that. 4,000 men that were murderers? That's a lot of, that's a lot of criminals there, isn't it? who have committed murder. So, so I don't know how they determined that that number at that time, whether that's accurate or this soldier's just thinking this, speculating. Uh, Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I... Be, Beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a, a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and that's how that chapter ends. So next week's chapter, we get into what he said, I guess. I thought it all, they, they stopped that chapter right there. I mean, I'm, I don't know how they decided that, but. Anyone uh, have anything to add to the lesson? Anything you want to say or comment on? Or?